Fantastic. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew Silverstein, uh, CEO of Amper. This is Cole Ingram, who's our Chief Composer Architect. Uh, happy to uh, share with you Amper, um, which is uh, an AI composer, performer, and producer that creates unique music tailored to any content in a matter of seconds. And so I'll give you a general background for the company. I'm going to let Cole walk you through the technical details, and then I'll show you actually how this gets used uh, in the real world. Uh, we founded Amper in 2014. Uh, myself and two partners used to be uh, film composers in Los Angeles. We wrote music for big blockbuster movies, uh, TV shows, and video games. And based on that experience, uh, based on us seeing the effect of technological advancement on creativity, we came together with a belief that the future of music would be created through the combination of human creativity and artificial intelligence. And we wanted that uh, collaborative process to propel the creative process forward in an enhancing way, in a way that helps both musicians and non-musicians express, themsel express themselves through music more efficiently, more productively, and more creatively. And so we set out to teach computers to be intrinsically creative, uh, to enable creative relationships between humans and machines, and ultimately, as I mentioned, to allow anyone to create unique music uh, based on the input that they want to share with Amper in a matter of seconds. And so with that context, I'm going to let Cole walk you through uh, how we approach this problem, and then I'll kind of step back on stage in a few minutes. Thanks. All right, so uh, specifically what I'm gonna be talking about is the idea of computational creativity and some ways to look at that. Um, so basically, what does uh, what is being creative mean when you're a computer? Um, what are some approaches to that? Um, and how you can figure out what the best approach for your particular problem is? Uh, and then some, uh, some concern, well, this is primarily concerned with uh, sort of high level thoughts on that and less about uh, specifically implementing anything. So, first of all, uh, so what is creativity? Uh, something that uses like uh, imagination uh, and is usually uh, in creating some sort of artistic work. So in order to understand that, we should define what artistic means. So uh, having some sort of creative uh, property of it, well, that's not very helpful, but uh, it's also aesthetically pleasing. So great, let's look at aesthetic. Well, that is not very helpful. Um, and you can see that this is very circular and sort of like eats itself as you're trying to define it. So what we're gonna go with um, is the idea that you have some sort of uh, novel output that you're trying to get uh, and that there's an underlying sort of uh, thread to how you come up with that, something that's uh, cohesive and keeps it together, sort of wrapping in the aesthetic side of things. So um, this idea of a top-down approach, uh, it's basically define your, whoops, Things come up over here differently. Uh, so finding an answer that is novel and useful, uh, being able to uh, <coughs> uh, clarify a problem that was uh, once vague. That's the idea of being, you're approaching this from a top down, let's look at what we're trying to do and how do we actually solve that. As opposed to say a bottom up approach, which is um, more of the AI data driven uh, machine learning sort of approach where you take a bunch of examples of things and you figure out how to solve the problem coming up from examples of it. So just this idea, um, this idea that you have two ways of approaching the same problem. You can either sort of look at it from a bird's eye and say like what is the structure of what I'm trying to do uh, and then I will figure out things to take care of that versus I'm gonna have a bunch of examples of the problem I'm trying to solve and let's try and figure out the structure from there. So this brings up um, a question of when you're working with data, that's analysis basically of things that have happened. And when you're working with something creative, you're trying to be uh, generative. So uh, there's a relationship between generation and analysis. Um, usually with generation, you're trying to create something that does not exist versus with analysis, you're trying to take something that does exist and figure out something about it. Um, you're interested in having novel output um, whereas analysis a lot of times is, is based on you're trying to generalize over the output so that you know what you're gonna get based on what you put into it. Um, yeah, so examples of creative, uh, creative uses of this generation, what we do, making co uh, music composition uh, versus um, something like Spotify, Pandora, other recommendation systems are great uses of the, um, the generalization over input. 
So um, the two things are sort of related though. So if we are going to take an approach of using generation and analysis together, well, you have to have something to analyze in order to generate it and in order to, to it's sort of like the definition of creativity, it's very circular. So this can be um, a problem of just, you need to figure out a place to start um, where you're getting your data from or I'm just gonna make something and analyze it later. So uh, generation by analysis. Let's say that I have a bunch of data, I'm trying to analyze it and then generate things like it. The result of that that you're gonna get is usually things are somewhat homogenous. They will look like your data set. Um, you're not going to get things that are not in the data set because you got everything from the data set. So this is a concern if you're trying to do something very novel. So what if we generate and then analyze what we've got? Um, well, so you have to have some sort of target in mind, like I wanna do this kind of thing, then I'm going to make it and then see how close that I got. Well, that's a very sort of guess and check approach. Uh, um, so that, depending on your uh, usage, could be good, could be bad. Or you could just say, screw it, let's generate and not care what uh, the output is, which can also be good or bad. Um, if you're trying to do um, quality assurance, that's not usually a way that you wanna go, but if you're doing, um, say, a bunch of avant-garde digital art, totally valid. So, how do I know which one to use? It depends. Uh, so, uh, a lot of uh, examples of these things, not even necessarily creative, um, like compile time code generation and optimization. Um, that, obviously, it has to, like, you generate some compiled code, you analyze it, you do an optimization pass, you run it again. So that's the generation, then analysis uh, approach. Um, <clears throat> If you're trying to go for like photorealism, then you're probably gonna wanna be really close to your input, so um, generation by analysis for that. Or, like I said, uh, avant-garde art, guard art, you're probably going to not care as much about the analysis in the end. So, um, the idea of novelty. So, you want to be able to um, induce some variance into what you're getting, because if your program always gives you the exact same output, that's novel exactly once, which is not what you want. Um, so some considerations with that is like, how much do you want it to vary? How do you determine what can be varied? Uh, and then how much control do you ultimately want to uh, have over that whole process? <clears throat> so this uh, ends up being really dependent on what you need. Um, and I, I always like to give sort of a, a caveat of uh, being careful of uh, things that are heavily dependent on probability. So especially if you're coming from sort of the bottom-up approach where it's very data-driven, um, a good way of generalizing that usually is being very probabilistic and saying there's this much percentage chance of doing this and this falls in a bell curve, things like that. Um, probabilities tell you how frequently something happens, but it does not tell you anything like why or when that was supposed to happen. It's based totally on sort of your data window, so you need to be careful when um, putting too much stock in probability by itself. So then determining what actually can be varied. This also depends on what your uh, use case is. Um, so an example of like text generation, there's all of this um, machine learning uh, interest in natural language processing and things. A very good thing that you can vary in uh, sentences is say using synonyms for different words. A thing you probably don't wanna vary is the actual grammar and syntax, because uh, then it becomes not actually the text that you were expecting it to be, right? And then so, how much control do you want over that? It also depends. Um, so basically, you can, uh, you can take sort of the uh, back and forth between, so if something is random versus something is procedural. Procedural, for instance, is stuff that is, has a randomness to it, but all of the pieces that are uh, being put together randomly are already curated by people. Um, so, or you could go with the, I just define something, it makes something, there it's done. So, totally project dependent. Uh, and that's sort of the theme of all of this is that um, the, these are all different approaches you can use, but it ultimately comes down to what actually are you trying to do. Um, and then about the whole idea of randomness, uh, if you've ever had to QA anything that has a random number generator in it, it is uh, painful. So um, it's, I find it's much better and easier to focus on writing, um, writing systems which are deterministic 
in their individual components and putting them together in a way that is complex and seems non-deterministic, but that way you can actually reason about what it does versus um, relying on some sort of totally uh, pseudo-random process that uh, you can't actually control um, with certainty what it will do. With that, I'm back. Uh, and so what I want to do is share with you how these philosophical concepts uh, come into play with Amper, uh, what we built Amper on, and then obviously going to show it to you. Um, so uh, with Amper, uh, we've got uh, a few requirements when we set out to build it. We said it must be fast. Um, wait, we'll just kind of skip some slides. It must be fast, it must be good, uh, and it must offer a, a level of control to the user. Uh, now, to the speed part, you know, we know uh, when there is no human way to control a certain process or to, to recreate it, to, to program it, uh, neural networks can be a fantastic tool. But when something can be done uh, with a human created process, uh, then factually, oftentimes it's faster than a neural network. And if you can create a lookup table, if you, if you can pre process that uh, compute, then that actually will be faster than just creating the hand code. And what this comes back to is Cole's point that it depends on what your use case is. There are situations when you need a neural network to help uh, crunch data that you otherwise couldn't do. There are also situations when you have the ability to pre-compute and pre-populate a lookup table uh, to use that in its most uh, useful way. And so as we looked at Amper, we said, how can we combine the three of these things together to make a very fast composer? The next thing we said is music must be good because if it's bad, it's useless. Uh, except for 1970s video games, and uh, true fact. You know, one of the things uh, about uh, good music is it's subjective. There's no right answer, right? And where neural networks can do a great job with is when there's an objective answer. Is it, is it a dog, is it a cat? Am I right, am I wrong? Uh, everyone in this room might have a different opinion of music, right? and, and we're all correct. There is no wrong answer. Uh, and so to make music good, you've got to uh, say, what is good for you? What is good for you and what is good for me? Now, to get a training set for every individual uh, to learn what that means is quite difficult. It's doable, uh, and it's certainly part of the approach that we take. But we're also really fortunate to have a team of professional musicians who are also engineers. And we leverage the fact that music and the theory behind music, the training, the history, uh, has been taught for hundreds and hundreds of years. It can be defined, at least at a high level. And we're able to uh, use these intrinsically designed features and functionality of music uh, to combine them with a level of subjectivity on an individual level to come up with music that hopefully is good, uh, not only to the massive room here, but to each individual as you use it. And lastly, you must have control. Right? Music is creative, and creative things should be collaborative. And again, what that underscores is that in order to be collaborative, you must have contextual awareness for how you've done something. If I want to go back and forth with you, when I'm creating something, I, you better know why you make the decisions that you made so that we can, we can iterate. Uh, neural networks, as we know, are inherently a black box. You know the input, you know the output. What happens in between then, uh, in between there, is generally shady. And so by um, defining the structural levels that we want, by putting candles on them to understand where should we give control to a user, what should we expose, how should we balance uh, the needs of someone who's musically illiterate with someone who uh, writes music every day, and, and how can we create uh, an AI that affords them both the ability to be creative together um, was a challenge that we worked through and we continue to work through. Um, but quality, speed, and control, the three kind of pillars that we brought the principles of computational creativity into. Uh, and with that, I'd love to kind of spend the last minute and a half just showing you how Amper makes music. All right, fantastic. So Amper is a web app. Creative Brandon Cloud, um, available uh, here or via an API that integrates directly into content creation or distribution platforms. The most simple way to use Amper is to share three pieces of information, the style of music you want to create, the mood you want to convey, and the length of that music. So uh, happy to do a live or a, a collaborative demo later on, but due to the fact that I have 41 seconds, we're going to blitz. Um, so I would say, great, let's create a piece of music. Uh, perhaps it should be cinematic. And then I would say, what mood do I want this music to convey? Um, great, epic driving, and how long should it be? Uh, great, we'll go with 30 seconds. So now Amper's gonna create a unique piece of music, note by note written from scratch. There's no loops, there's no licensed material, there's, this has been generated uh, in real time, uh, out of thin air, uh, using proprietary sample libraries, proprietary uh, logic, and this 
is epic driving cinematic music composed by Amper. Now, what's great about it is I said it's iterative, it's collaborative, right? It, that's not the only thing we can do. We might say, and we'll go to the professional workflow because it gives us more control, but you know what, Amper? That was good, uh, but why don't we, instead of, of just leaving that, why don't we change that instrumentation? Right? We, we wanted it to be a bit different. Uh, that Epic, for me, uh, is a bit faster. Uh, perhaps uh, I want to make sure that I accent a certain moment in the music, so why don't we add a cymbal swell? And obviously you can sync the picture if you'd like to uh, for video editors and video producers. But now we're going to say, Amper, take that music that we created, take my feedback, right? We're going to reorchestrate it, we're going to change the tempo, which means we inherently have to write the music in a different way. That's a certain amount of time. We're going to add a certain accent, and before I finish talking, uh, we just changed it. And the possibilities are endless, right? You can, eventually, you download the music, you get a royalty-free uh, perpetual license to use it, uh, and you're good to go. So thank you very much. Welcome to Amper. Can, can, can we do a, uh, a minute and a half collaborative demo? This is too fun. Yeah, you want to do it? <laughs> how, do, how do you want to do it? Like people, you offer options and people choose? Yeah, sure. Let's, we'll, uh, all right, we'll, uh, why not? We'll start with the simple. Who wants to pick a style of music? Anyone, anyone? Bueller. I think we have rock. a classic okay. rock. We'll uh, and what mood would we like to convey? Playful? OK. Uh, and how long would we like it to be? Great, 30 seconds. Everyone just says that's good. Um, all right, so now we're going to create uh, playful, classic rock music written from scratch. I hope it's not terrible. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Uh, so Empress decided to create a piece of music with basses, guitars, keys, and percussion. Let's do another one, a harder one. All right. And what's important is if we said playful classic rock is what we liked, we didn't want that piece of music, right? You can regenerate music. You can use this rewrite button here. You'll always get a unique piece of music. We're not pulling from a library of pre-composed tracks. We're actually writing this music as you see the progress bar move forward. All right, Matt, your turn. What do you want to create? We can iterate on this or we can create from scratch. Uh, let's try another one. That was great. Let's try another one. Okay. Uh, not yet. We're, we're working on that. Um, one problem at a time. Um, why don't we we'll, we'll look at the professional workflow this time? And again, it just gives users more control. Um, you've got you know instrumentation level. So a different mood. Uh, different okay, great. Yeah. Style. What do we want to do? Like nineties pop. Nineties pop. 90s All pop right. Style. Everyone wants some Savage Garden. Um, and again, what mood would we like to convey? All right. <laughs> We're now going it's into emo territory. Now it's more like the Backstreet Boys. Um, <laughs> and we can, again, we can, the whole principle behind Amper is we can tell Amper will make all the decisions necessary. Y so you know we want full bongos. <laughs> <laughs> we want full bongos. Well, in case you didn't know what full, bon full bongos mean, that's what we're getting. Now it'll be a bit more orchestrated, but that's a bongo. Um, I don't know what a bongo is. So... It's a classic instrument of 90s pop. What's that? Um, and of course, you, you know, you can adjust instrument. You can adjust when things end. So we're going to create, uh, all we've said is like 90s pop. Um, what is he, brooding? Brooding um, and bongos. And we wanted to make sure there were bongos, uh, <laughs> which is better than saying make sure there's cowbell. Um, <laughs> here's what we just made. How'd we do? Awesome. <laughs> and again, if you go to ampermusic.com, you can access this for free right now, play around with it yourself, and uh, power the music behind whatever content that you create.
Thank you. I think those were my questions, so I'll uh, <laughs> just this one. I work with people that are making pitch videos a lot uh, for crowdfunding campaigns, sure. and oftentimes they'll watch like you know an, an iPhone ad or something, and they'll want a track that's really similar. Um, and I was just wondering, are you able to like? put a YouTube link to a song so that it could generate something that sounds similar but that is kind of kind of free reign? Um, or is that kind of in the future? Sure, I mean, technologically possible, absolutely. Um, our lawyers have a heart attack every time I mention that just because <laughs> of copyright law. Um, so yes, it, you know, it's something that we think a lot about. And it goes back to that same concept of generation and analysis and how those work together. Um, you can see there's a reason why when we described music, we said brooding 90s pop. Right? It's hard to get in trouble uh, when those are the words that you're using to describe music uh, versus if I said, you know, but Madonna, 1981, right? That's, I'm going to, she'll, her lawyers wouldn't be happy with me. Um, but pitch videos are a great use of Amper. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so I assume you don't think that algorithms are going to replace music musicians completely in the near future. Um, so I'm wondering where do you see Amper in the ecosystem of like music in 10 years? It's a great question. Uh, we think Amper's gonna power all of the world's music. And we mean that from two perspectives. Uh, one is, you know, we look at functional music, right? Music that's valued for its use case, uh, but not necessarily valued for the collaboration and the creation that goes into making it. Like, you could, we're gonna stick it in the background, it doesn't really matter, it just needs to be there. In those cases, I think Amper will uh, be a very powerful end-to-end -end solution for non-musical creatives to express themselves and to get, they get the music that they want. At the same time, we see artistic music, right? Music valued for the collaboration, the creativity that goes into making it. It's part of what makes us human, is wanting to create music together with people or just be a person making music. And in that case, we see Amper as being the most trusted collaborative tool and partner for musicians, artists, and composers to help them be more effective at what they're already doing. And so in that way, whether uh, functional or artistic, Amper will power all of the world's music. Small role. <laughs> are your main customers musicians or are they the studios? Uh, so our main customers are, are... There's also one other question. You said it's royalty free, so can you just explain that? Sure. Um, so our main customers are content creators. Right now it's a lot of video editors, video producers. Uh, companies who would have a high volume of output might otherwise use license or stock music. And we can say, why don't we solve search? Because you're no longer searching for music. We can solve uh, the legal and financial issues around licensing. Uh, and in fact, we can create something that's collaborative and unique to you. It tends to be a very effective... Uh, conversation and, and a very deep pain point that most video creators feel. But Amber is also useful for video, uh, video game creation, VR, AR, advertising, streaming, performance. And then to the royalty aspect, royalty free. What we mean is you're, once you've got Amper licensed, right, and, and Amp, our company retains the ownership of the content, but we license it to you to use however you'd like. You can continue to use that for any different project you're working on, any different use case, any different sync, without having to pay again, without having to pay, you know, pay us uh, for that opportunity to use it again, which is oftentimes in uh, commercial production of, of content a, um, a major headache and a major cost. And when we can say, we'll create a unique piece of music that's perfect for you every single time, whatever your content is going to be, uh, we get rid of the, ne the necessity to monetize a limited library of content every time you reuse it. Thank you. Well, there forms of music that are easier or harder. So I guess the, probably the obvious example would be Bach, is a very structured kind of point music. Is that, does it make it super hard or super easy versus pop? Uh, it sort of depends. Like um, if you're familiar at all with, there was a machine learning um, project, uh, I think it was done at sort of like a hackathon called Deep Jazz where he uh, machine learned uh, Pat Metheny avant-garde jazz. That actually works quite well because uh, no one has a preconceived idea of what it should actually sound like. So um, in that case, that's a lot easier than something like Bach. Uh, at the other hand, um, if you're taking specifically Bach or something that's very classical, we have a lot of examples of that. Bach wrote quite a lot of music. So um, it, it's easier to get things out of it, but maybe harder to make something that's convincingly this is Bach, even though there are people doing that too. We'll do this one, then last one there. Yeah, I um, 
I read recently, and I forget the name of the composer, but uh, s there's a composer that uh, claims to be the composer behind almost like 90% of the major pop hits this is Max in the Martin. world. I'm sorry? Max Martin. Yeah, right. And, and in the article it mentioned that there's some kind of pattern to to the way that he structured the the songs. I'm not a musician, so I don't I don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> but but I would it is it possible? Does, can your machine or your program analyze songs and identify which ones might become wildly popular versus not? Or can you cr or can you can you create something? By analyzing songs that have just become absolute wild hits, and then predict which ones might become ones. Could it be a hit machine? You want to hit it? Sure. <laughs> um, the short answer is certainly you can analyze music, I, and you know the analogy that I think represents you know a parallel of your question is you know why does top forty music all sort of sound the same, uh, but they're all unique. They're all new pieces of music. Right, because there are patterns in music, and that's what allows us to be successful. If everything was completely random and unexpected, then Amper couldn't do its job very well. Uh, and so uh, our, our ph philosophical approach is, is not uh, to analyze every single piece of music and to pull that together and just make something replicated from that, though it's possible. But rather, we say, can we teach a computer to be intrinsically creative? And then to express that creativity through music. Can we approach this as a creativity and a music problem and not necessarily as a data science and a math problem. And if we do that, we can make something that sounds like this, uh, which hopefully continues to push the edge uh, and, and push the envelope in terms of the frontier of ANI. Thank you. Um, so I have last question. I have a final question. It's a two-part question. The first one is uh, for this uh, um, composer who may have created patterns, how, does, uh, how do we make sure that you're not Using those patterns in your um, in your ver ver variety of uh, topics, and secondly, let's say that I licensed it from you, and how do I protect that unique music that I created with you from other people taking it and using it in their videos? You want to do the one other number two? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, f first of all, there's. Music is not totally objective. Uh, it's a lot more subjective. So you get into the question of, uh, did this person use something from me, uh, if you know the baseline from Ice Ice Baby? Uh, like, courts have a hard time with this. Uh, there's also just the general thing of two things can be objectively different, but subjectively very similar. Like, this is the same thing, except one note was changed. Is that the same? Is it not? It's sort of, uh, that's a difficult question for anyone. Totally the same. Right. <laughs> um, doom, 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 doom. <laughs> but it also depends sort of on the length of things. Like if you were to take two pieces of music, both of which are one second long, there's a high probability those will actually be objectively the same. If you talk about 30 seconds, two minutes, three hours, um, then there's a lot more sort of wiggle, wiggle room with that. So it, it's, uh, the answer is yes. And to your second point, you know, Amper is designed it to intrinsically make sure that it doesn't recreate music uh, again and again. There are you know, quadrillions of options that Amper can create. Uh, the time that it creates music twice is going to be a great problem for our company because it means we've been around for a long time and done a lot of things. Uh, now, whether users after they create music with Amper uh, can protect that from somebody else, it's kind of beyond our scope. But we've made sure that uh, we've designed Amper to be a unique composer, to allow everyone to create unique, unique music every single time you use it. Thank you. Uh, All right. We'll and the last thing to say is we're hiring. So if you are uh, interested in it, please come talk with us later. Uh, I appreciate it. Many things. <laughs>